يا علي يا ساكن بقلبي وعليك يا ظل نحبي يا بني يا ركبار يا ساكن بقلبي وعليك يا ظل نحبي يا بني يا ركبار <تصفيق> اعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أب القاسم محمد الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما ولي الله العظم حجة الله ابن الحسن صاحب الأمر والزمان صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة السلام على من جعل الله الشفاء في تربتي السلام على من الإجابة تحت كبتي السلام على ساكن كربلاء فيا ليتنا ثم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي يا سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أما بعد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكذلك أعثرنا عليهم ليعلموا أن وعد الله حق وأن الساعة لا ريب فيها إذ يتنازعون عليهم أمرهم فكانوا بنوا عليهم بنيانا ربهم أعلم بهم قال الذين غلبوا على أمرهم لنتخذن عليهم مسجدا صدق الله العلي العظيم وأمنا به زينوا مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد ثانيا لك 
قضاء الحوائج ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب الأمر The lovers of Ali Muhammad have been persecuted and have been accused of blasphemy because of their fundamental belief in the concept of ziyara. Whereas you will find that the Nawasib and the Khawarij of our time insist that building any structure over a grave or making a masjid in a place where there are graves located and even more if a person was to recite salah in the vicinity of the grave all of this constitutes bid'ah and for this reason perhaps or for many of the reasons one of the major reasons being that the Shias of Ali Muhammad and their tamassuk they're hanging on to the concept of ziyara and their deep-rooted aqidah in ziyara have been victims of assassination and victims of killing from time immemorial. You will find it was during the time of the Bani Abbas, during the time of our 9th, 10th and the 11th Imams that the Zawar of Sayyid al-Shuhada would be persecuted on their way such that if a person wanted to go for ziyara as a fine in return, they would amputate one of his arms. If one of the years they amputated his right arm, the next year they would amputate the left arm to go for the ziyara of Sayyid al-Shuhada. If they found that both their arms are amputated, they would amputate or cut off one of the legs. If they found that both the hands and one of the legs are cut, they would cut the fourth, the, the second leg. Yet despite this, if a person has both his hands cut off and both his legs cut off, Meaning what? He has gone for ziyara four times. The fifth time when they would not have anything to cut for him or when he didn't have any limbs to walk towards Sayyid al-Shuhada, they would come crawling on their bellies towards Imam al Hussein. Which is why the poem or the poet records this famous poem where he says, وَلَوْ كَتَّعُوا أَيْدِيْنَا وَأَرْجُلِنَا لَنُعْتِيكَ زَحْفًا يَا حُسَيْنَ If they cut our hands and they cut our legs, we would come crawling to you on our stomachs, Ya Hussein. For it becomes fundamental for us to understand the concept of ziyara and to understand the concept of building structures or a mosque over the places where the graves of the Anbiya, the Awliya and the Awsiya are. Tonight from this very vast topic we are going to select only a specialized argument under the major title of Ziyarat al kubur and the topic that we are going to discuss or the issue that we are going to discuss at hand is is it permissible to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the vicinity of the graves of the awliya and the awsiya and the anbiya or no? And out of our etiquette, because we are from the school of Ali Muhammad and because we have the tarbiyah of Imam al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. We shall address this discussion in a very rational, academic, non-violent manner using the Qur'an, that single undisputed book amongst all the Muslims to warrant the belief in worshipping and reciting Salah and rather building a mosque around the graves of the Anbiya and the Awliya is not from shirk, rather is a sunnah ilahiya. We shall look at two proofs. The first proof of this is in regards to Surah Al-Kahf verse 21. The verse of the Quran that we recited after the khutbah. Antum, you must all be familiar with the event of Ashab Al-Kahf. Over here during the time of the Ashab Al-Kahf, there was a tyrant and there was a king who was forcing the people to worship idols. And amongst this entire social environment, amongst this community, there were a group of seven, according to one tradition and according to another tradition, eight youth. These were youth who were monotheists, who strongly adhered to the belief in one God. 
the creator of the universe, the Lord of the universe, who cannot be seen, who cannot be touched. But because of the pressure of the kings and the army of the kings to force people and to coerce people into idol worship, you find that these seven or eight youth decided to leave the country, to leave the city and take refuge in the mountain from many of the mountains that were surrounding that city. When they went into the mouth of the mountain or into the cave, they then fell asleep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his divine will wished that they should sleep for a period of odd 300 years, give or take, plus or minus here and there according to the different traditions. But they fell asleep for 300 years. After they woke up, the companions asked each other, how much do you think we have slept? When they look outside the cave, they saw that the sun was in the position of Zawwal. So they looked at each other, they wondered, they asked each other, how long do you think we have slept? They said, perhaps we have slept for a day maximum or a day and a half because we went to sleep at the time of when the sun was at Zawwal. We have woken up, the sun again is during Zawwal. They thought they probably slept the night over because of their exhaustion. For when they woke up and they thought that they have slept for an hour, for a day or a day and a half, they sent one of their companions to go back into the outskirts of the village. Not the same village that they ran away from, from the outskirts of the village and to go, excuse me, to go and to purchase food. Now this guys or these guys, these companions have been sleeping for 300 years. When the companion comes down into the city or into the village to buy food, he sees, Habibi, Ajib, the buildings have changed, the people have changed, even the language has changed, the way of them wearing their clothes has even changed. Ajib. Imagine into you, if you are sitting in this area and you have somebody who's, who comes into your center wearing clothes of 300 years ago. He comes wearing clothes from 1780 or 1800 AD. What will you think about the guy? You say, oh, Jama Vipi Bana Mingya Apo, if you're not Limasi, if you're... Ajib, you get stuck. And then on top of that, even more surprising than that, because he wants to buy food, he goes and he removes money. This currency, Ya Habibi, is currency that was used 300 years ago. If it was me and you, would probably think, Bana, this Jama has robbed the museum and come to buy his food from us over here. For more than he was stunned, even the people around him were stunned. Shunul Qadiyya, what is the matter over here? For the person, the companion of the cave, the Ashab, related to them, and he explained to them that there was a king who was a tyrant, was forcing us to idol worship. So me and my companions ran away to a cave. So when the people of the city came together to see what has happened and they listened to the story for him, they said, Baba, you're not sleeping for one day. You have slept for over 300 years. This is a miracle. He himself, he was astonished. The people are also astonished. What happens? The shopkeeper went back to the king who after 300 years, the king that was ruling over the land happened to be a mu'min, believer in the tawheed, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he went to the king and he narrated to them, there are these seven companions in this part of the cave or in this part of the mountain. They have been asleep for 300 years and they ran away because they were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were worshipping one God. The king being a mu'min wanted to meet them. So he left the, uh, the palace or the castle with an entourage of his supporters and an entourage of the civilians. And at the same time, this one companion who had come to the market to buy food went back to the mountain. He went back to the mountain and told his companions, Oh, my fellow companions, my colleagues, we have been sleeping for 300 years. This is what has happened. The king and his entourage are now coming to see us such that they can verify the story with their own eyes. What shall we do? The companions sat together and they decided at this time, listen, you know what? We don't want any fame. We don't want to cause any, the way we would say in our language, we don't want to cause any food in the majma. We don't want there to be a big drama. Ahna, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah. Make us to go back to sleep until the appointed time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered their dua and they fell asleep from that time until now. And it is narrated that they will be from the companions of Imam Sahib al Amri wa Zaman. For when they reached the king and his entourage reached the mountain or the place of the cave which the other companion had described to them, they saw that there is no trace over there of the cave. There is no trace of where they entered, where they are hiding. 
And so this is where the verse of the Quran comes into play that we recited at the beginning. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, He now discusses or He describes the situation. He says, The people now are confused. Where is the opening of this cave? Just now only there was an opening to the mountain. Now it has disappeared. So they began to discuss what should we do. They had differences of opinion. How should we get to the Ashab? How can we revere them? What should we do? For Kalu, for some of them who were there, for Kalu, Ibn Alayhim Bunyana. He says, build upon them a structure. Where is the mass of the mountain where they were hiding? Build a structure, whether it is a shed, whether it is a roofed house, or whatever it is. He said, you build them a structure. Rabbukum a'lamu bihim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most learned. He knows what is their situation. وَكَالَ الَّذِينَ غَلَبُوا عَلَىٰ أَمْرِهِمْ And then the king said, لَنَتَّخِذَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ مَسْجِدًا He said, we shall build upon his place. Yani to mark the significance of the Ashab al-Kahf, we should build a masjid. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this narration in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, verse 21. You don't find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebuking them that they built a masjid over where the companions of the Ashab were sleeping, or where the companions of the cave were sleeping. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't tell Rasulullah, go all the way there and demolish that mosque and bring it down. La, rather this was an action which is praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. This is a place where people who were persecuted because of their belief in Tawheed ran and sought asylum. Build a masjid here. Let people come and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. The wisdom behind it is that when people like me and you go to this masjid and we hear about the story of the companions of the cave, even we get inspired that we need to be firm and staunch when it comes to practicing the message of Tawheed. This is the wisdom behind it. Tell you. A person might come and say, Shaykh, now over here there is an ishqal. We can build a masjid over a group of people who, are build, who have been sleeping for 300 years. But how does this justify the fact that you build a masjid or you build a kubba or you build a dome over the graves of people who have died? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, and according to the hadith, they slept for 300 years, they have not died, but they, Nawasib and the Khawarij, they come to us and they tell us, but Ali ibn Abi Talib has died, Zayd al-Shuhada, Imam al-Hussein has died, Ali al-Hadi has died, Muhammad al-Jawad has died, then they have died, these people have not died, they are alive. We say to them, Ya Habibi, return back to the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa la tahsabanna al-ladheena kutilu fi shabili al if you think Amir al Mu'mineen is dead, if you think Sayyid al Shuhada is dead, you are very mistaken. These are people who gained eternity through martyrdom. Which is why ahna we have in our hadith, all of you who inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the barakah to visit Sayyid al-Shuhada in Karbala. All of you Matamis, all of you Azadar, my sisters, my mothers who are coming for, zia, for majalis from morning to night. We have in our tradition by Imam al-Sadiq mentioned in Kamil al-Ziyarat that Sayyid al-Shuhada is alive and sitting on the right side of the arsh. He looks down to the dunya, he looks at those people who are performing their ziyara and he looks at those people who are crying in their majalis and he seeks forgiveness for them and he asks his father yani amir al-mu'minin and zahra to seek forgiveness for them fa'anto azadar lovers of sayyid al-shuhada when you come to this majlis al-aza al-mubarak from morning till evening sayyid al-shuhada is looking at you from the arsh not only does he do istighfar, he asks Amir al Mu'minin to do istighfar for you. You should know who is Amir al Mu'minin? Kasim al Nari wal Jannah. Who is Sayyid al Sahra? Inna Allah yarda li ridaha. Allahu Akbar. They do istighfar for you. For if it is permissible and it is mamduh, it is praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that a masjid should be built in the place of the ashab al-kahf. 
and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be worshipped there and salat should be recited there, then by tariq al-awla there should be a masjid in the places of the graves of Sayyid al-Shuhada and Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba and Imam al-Baqir because their jihad was much greater than the jihad of the Ashab al-Kahf. Afala yatadabbaru, afala yatafakkaru. Hai wahid. Second proof after a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 125 says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wattakhadu min maqami Ibrahim musallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran commands the entire Muslim Ummah, rather the Khitab Quran is for all human beings, so the particular verse is for the Mu'mins, or the Muslims rather, sorry, and the Khitab, because the Quran is a divine book for all mankind, the Khitab is towards the entire mankind. However, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اِتَّخَذُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُسَلَّى where is the maqam of Nabi Ibrahim? Make it into a musalla. Musalla means what? This meme, some of the mufassireen of the Quran or ulama of grammar will tell you that this is a meme masdari that denotes maqam, meaning where the maqam of Ibrahim is, the surrounding areas around the maqam Ibrahim, make it a place of salat, musalla. Not musalla is in a La no, musalla, place of praying. Make this a place of praying. You will not find any two Muslims from the east of the world to the west of the world who will dispute about the fadila of reciting a salat in Masjid al Haram. Is there any dispute? And now we have in our traditions from our fifth and our sixth Imam that a person who recites a wajib salah in the masjid, his thawab is that of an umrah. And this is a tradition or similar traditions are found even in the kutah, in the, in, the in the books of the mukhalifin. No two Muslims dispute about the fadail of reciting salat, whether it is a nafila, whether it is jama'ah, whether, whether it is wajib, whether it is jama'ah or whether it is mustahab. To recite salat in Masjid al Haram has its own fadila. And from Masjid al Haram to recite your salat next to Maqam Ibrahim, it has its own value. You recite your salat next to Hijr Ismail, it has its own fadail. You recite salat next to Rukn al Yamani, it has its own fadila. Tayyib, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take the place of Maqam Ibrahim to become what? A place of your prayer. Now you come to the ulama who are non-Shia, even from the Mukhalifin, you have a scholar by the name of Ibn Jawzi in his book, Muthir al-Gharama. He states, بين المقام إلى الركن إلى زمزم إلى الحجر He says, over here, Rukn means Hajar al-Aswad. He says, from the Hajar al-Aswad, to the maqam of Ibrahim, to the place where the well of Zamzam is, on the left of maqam Ibrahim, before it used to be, now it is demolished. So from the Hajar al-Aswad until the maqam of Ibrahim, from maqam of Ibrahim until the place of Zamzam, correct? From the place of Zamzam until the place of Hijr Ismail. Ibn Jawzi says, من الركن إلى المقام إلى زمزم إلى الحجر Kubur tis'a wa tis'in nabiyyan. Ibn Jawzi says that between from the Hajar al-Aswad to the Maqam Ibrahim, to the place of the Zamzam, there is the graves of 99 prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, make the place of Ibrahim, the maqam of Ibrahim, a place of your prayer. وَاتَّخَدُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُسَلَّى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't know that in the maqam of Ibrahim there are 99 graves. Despite there being 99 graves of the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا, only I want you to pray over there. وَاتَّخَدُوا Those of you who have studied Arabic grammar, اتَّخَذُوا فِي الْعَامْرِ ظَاهِرَ لَلْوُجُومِ Well, we say that in this case is istihbab because there are external karina. 
for why do they demolish our shrines? Why do they call us kafir? Or why do they say it is shirk to recite salat by the grave? There is an important difference. We are saying salat by the grave, not salat to the grave. The salat is to edge Qibla. So you come and you tell the khawarij, Ya Habibi, the scholars themselves say, in the way you recite your Salatul Jama'ah, there are 99 graves. If you have a problem with reciting Salat by the graves of the Anbiya and the Ausiya, Baba, go and change your Qibla. Go and change your Kaaba. Find someone else to recite. Why is the Ishqal always on the Shia for being kafir on this issue? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And the arguments and the proof are so many. Despite this, what happens to me and you if we go to Jannatul Baki or Jannatul Mu'alla only to recite a two rakat salat? Leave reciting two, uh, two rakat salat. This is a long thing. And so if you open your book, Bid'ah, you look at the grave, Bid'ah. Shunu, where is the proof? Where is the Muslim Ummah? Is this how the family of Rasulullah is repaid? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, مَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Imam Al-Mujtaba, Imam Al-Baqir, Imam Al-Sadiq, Imam Sajjad, Umm Al-Baneen. Year in, year out. How many of us cry for Abu Al-Fadl Al-Abbas? How many of us do the wasila of Abu Al-Fadl Al-Abbas? How many of our hajat has been accepted at the alam of Abu Al-Fadl Al-Abbas? How what a big service Abu Al-Fadil has done for Islam. There is not even a kubba for his mother, Umm Al-Baneen. Enter, you can't even go there and weep for Umm Al-Baneen. You stand there at her grave and you say, Adam ala lakil adri ya Umm Al-Baneen. Can you say? Can't say. Why? What is the Muslim Ummah doing in regards to Jannah al Baki? Me and you, what are we doing? Have we exerted enough effort to bring knowledge to clear the misconceptions about the issue of building over graves and taking it as a place of ibadah to the people or no? This is our history, not only the graves in Jannatul Baki and Jannatul Mu'alla, but all the mosques that have been demolished, Masjid Raddu Shams demolished, Masjid al Fatha demolished, the place of Khandak or Khaybar, you are not able to visit. Fadak al Maksuba, you are not able to visit. These are our Heritage, this is our history. The most utmost importance need to be taken in preserving these areas, in building or paying money towards their construction, making sure that these places are well kept and guarded. Why? When the entire Muslim Ummah, people like me and you, when we go to these places, when we see these graves, when we see these mosques, we start to understand our history. This is our heritage in front of us. Until when you see Masjid Raddu Shams and you hear this is where Rasulullah took back the sun for Amirul Mu'mineen. Your Iman increases, your determination increases. Every nation that has had a previous civilization has exerted maximum effort and taken maximum pain to ensure that they preserve their history. Every country you go across the world, you will find that there is a museum that talks about their history. And to look at Greece, a miskin country that is in financial crisis. One time there is high unemployment, austerity projects, Madrisu, all these problems. In Greece, they have a place known as the Acropolis. There is a monument of the Acropolis which is said to be built in 5 BC. It was the first place where, according to them, democracy was first established. You see in a place like this, between the years 2000 and 2006, reports suggest that not only Greece as a nation, but the entire EU community contributed and spent up to 27.5 million euros to ensure the preservation of that place. 27.5 million euros. If only a quarter of that amount was spent to preserve our heritage and to preserve our history. Between 2000 and 2006, these people who are named the Khadim al Haramain, what were they doing to our sites? Over here, over there, people are spending money to preserve the sites. And over here, people are spending money to destroy the sites. Ajib. 
our responsibility in these days of Shahr al-Muharram, al-Mubarak, that we start to contemplate as a community what can we do for Jannatul Baqi? What can we do for Jannatul Mu'allah in Makkah al mukarrama Do you know in a report that was independently established when in 2001 the shrine or the haram of Sayyida Amila was destroyed, the mother of Rasulullah, they used up to 20 kilos of dynamite to blow up the shrine. This is the jaza of the words, the mother of your Nabi. Now we don't call on any non-violent act or non-violent stance. Now we're people of Ghira, people of Akhlaq. We need to work in a very intellectual manner to educate the larger Muslim Ummah that to build structures over a grave. Your Habib is not shirk, is in the Quran. And number two, we are not praying to the grave. Rather, we are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in the vicinity of these graves, because this area has its divinity and spirituality attached to it. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> And I have big hope in the scouts and the youth of Dar es Salaam Jamaat. Hani and Lakum, in the same way that you make this Karbala project, inshallah, 8th of Shawwal, Yom Al Gham, you will think about a strategy or design a plan where you can make an entire scenario or an entire model of Jannatul Baqi and Jannatul Mu'alla. And inshallah, through the barakat of the youth of this community and their love for Sayyid al Shuhada, we will take the first step towards building a goal than Kubba in Jannatul Baqi. Keep this dream in your heart. It should not be far-fetched. Even if it doesn't happen in our lifetime, we should have that tamanna that it will happen with the dhuhur of our 12th Imam. Ilahi Amin. Ya Rab. Re time is racing against me. There is much to say, but to change the dynamics of the majlis from the concept of ziyarat al-kubur and visiting and reciting salat at the places of the awliya and the awsiya. We come tonight and we are gathered here to honor one of the greatest companions of Sayyid al-Shuhada, al-Shaheed Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. Today is Laylatul Jum'ah, a night where istighfar the doors of istighfar are open. And subhanallah, on Laylatul Jum'ah, when istighfar is accepted by Allah, we are taught how to do istighfar by a person like Hur. For we should take this night to follow in the models or to follow in the footsteps of Hur. Seek for the wasila and the shafa'a of Hur and the abis and Sayyid al-Shuhada such that our names may be enlisted from those who are forgiven on this night, such that when you come on the day of Ashura and you weep for Imam al Hussein, you weep as if you were sinless. Traditions narrate that the day of Ashura has approached. Antum Ahibai, I want you to travel with me down to Karbala. And it is as if you were present on the day of Ashura and you were watching the stance of Hur. The Adhan of Fajr is given. The Sayyid al-Shuhada and his companions recite his Salat and they come towards the battlefield. Sayyid al-Shuhada delivers three khutbas or two khutbas on the day of Ashura, inviting these people towards the right path, giving them a final chance towards istighfar. And the Hur all this time is sitting on the sidelines from the camp of Omar ibn Sa'ad al-La'in and he is watching their interactions with Sayyid al-Shuhada. Hur has been sitting at the front lines of the battlefield and he has been watching that the same people who wrote to Imam al Hussein to invite him to Kufa have now become the same people who are lifting swords and are ready to kill him. Hur has seen that for three days Imam al Hussein and his companions are thirsty. For three days he has heard the crying of the children and the weeping of the women because of their thirst. He sees how the Jews and the Christians leave other mankind. Hur himself says that we see how the pigs and the dogs drink from the Furat, but the pure women of Ahlul Bayt are not able to drink. 
you feel the heat in Dar es Salaam. How many times we drink water in a day? Fashlon, how did the children and the women of Ahlul Bayt go three days in the desert heat without drinking water? So a person cannot comprehend the intensity of the thirst and how they cried, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. Fahur ibn Yazid al he was watching this from the sidelines. And on the day of Ashura, when Imam al Hussein gave his khutbah, and he saw that Umar ibn Sa'ad al-La'in and Shimar bin dhil and al-La'in are bent upon war, Hur goes to them and he says, are you really going to fight and kill the daughter of Rasulullah? He say, yes, and the least of this war is that you will see heads are flying and limbs are flying in every direction. Hur contemplates upon this stance before the first arrow of the battle is shot. Hor is is contemplating over his stance. He says that in front of me, now the truth is very clear. Haq is very clear. I either have victory of the dunya and Jahannam under the banner of Umar ibn Sa'ad, or I have Jannah in front of me through istishad with Sayyid al-Shuhada. The narration tells us that Hor had a son by the name of Bukair. He calls his son. And he tells him, Ya Bunayya, la sabra li ala nari wa ala ghadab al jabbar, wa la yakun, wa yakunu khasmi ghadan al Muhammad al Mukhtar. He comes and he tells his son, O oh my son, Bukair, I do not have energy inside of me. I don't know what will happen to me or how I will be thrown into the fire of Jahannam tomorrow. I don't know how I will face the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I I don't know what answer I will give to Rasulullah tomorrow. He says, my son, I am leaving the camp now and I'm going to join Imam al Hussein. Bukair, look at the tarbiyah of a father towards the son. Huh? The son, Bukair, says to his father, oh father, whatever you decide, I am with you as long as we are on haq. The traditions tell us that Hor took his son and they started walking towards the camp of Sayyid al-Shuhada. How did he even look at the ihtaram, look at the manner in which Hor Hur walks towards the camp of Imam al Hussein. Sheikh al Ha'iri says that Hur came walking towards Imam al Hussein with his hands on his head like a prisoner, and he had turned his shield upside down, which is a symbol of surrender. He came to the tent of Imam al Hussein and he threw himself at the feet of the Imam. He began to kiss the sand under the feet of the Imam. He says to him, Assalamu alaikum, ya Abba Abdullah, <laughs> he says to him, Sayyidah Shuhada, Halmin al Tauba, I am the one who brought you into Karbala. I am the one who is the reason of all this. Look at the generosity of Imam al Hussein. This is why we say, O oh, people who have come for the Azza of Imam al Hussein, you people who are in the majlis of Imam al Hussein, even if a person had sins, that is the amount of the oceans. If you sincerely repent through Imam al Hussein on this night, Imam al Hussein will forgive you. Imam al Hussein looks at her and he says, In Tubta, Fatab Allah alayka. He says, If you have repented, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. How can I not forgive you? The tradition say, Imam al Hussein took Hur by his shoulders and then he hugged him. Hur said to him, O oh, Abba Abdullah, I have my son who wants to fight on your behalf. Imam al Hussein looks at this young person, this young child, the son of Hur. He says to them, Jazakumullah khairan anni. The traditions tell us Bukair kissed the hand of Sayyid al Shuhada. He went into the battlefield. He started to perform his jihad. He killed 40 people. Hur was standing by Imam al Hussein. At one time, an enemy came and he struck Bukair at the back of his head with a sword. Bukair fell down onto the ground. Inna lillah. When Hur looked at the body of his son, he said, Alhamdulillah. Hur began to smile. Allah, Allah, what type of father is this? He said, Hur began to smile. And he said, Alhamdulillah, oh my son, Allah has blessed you with shahada in the way of the, of the son of the daughter of Rasulullah. At this time, Hur looks at Imam al-Hussein. 
Hur looks towards Imam Al Hussein and he asks permission. He says, Ya Aba Abdullah, give me permission to go into the battlefield. Let me be the first one from your Ansar to be killed because I am the one, because I am the one who has caused you to be over here. The traditions tell us that Sayyidah Shuhada gave Hur permission. He got onto his horse with his sword, wearing his shield or wearing his armor. This is the jihad of Hur, huh? He walks into the battlefield saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-aliyy al And then he begins to recite the poem, Inni ana al-hur wa najli al-hur, ashja'u min dhi libadin hazir. He says, indeed I am free, I am the free one and the son of the free one. I am more courageous than the courageous lion. Hur goes into the battlefield, begins to fight with the enemies. The traditions tell us that he killed 50 of the kuffar, sending them into Jahannam wa bi'sal masir. Nobody was able to fight against Hur. Nobody was able to stand against him. So Umar ibn Sa'ad Allah, he tells all his companions, start shooting arrows towards Hur from every direction. <laughs> The narrations tell us that they began to shoot arrows at him from every direction. Hur began to receive arrows on his chest, arrows on his back, until he received an arrow on his neck. Hur fell down onto the ground. One of the kufar came and struck him on the head with a sword. Wa musibata. Hur cries and says, Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Abdullah. The traditions tell us Imam Hussein goes running towards Hor, he begins to wipe the blood. <laughs> He begins to wipe the blood from his face and the thought from his face. He says to him, Wallahi hakkan samati ummika hurran fa inta hur fit dunya wal akhira. Inna lillah. وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ وَلَعَنَتُ اللَّهَ عَلَى قَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ مِنَ الْعَانِ إِلَى قِيَابِ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ عَذَمَ اللَّهَ لَكَ الْعَجْرِ يَا مَوْلَانَ يَا صَاحِبَ الْعَمْرُ وَبِحَقِّ السَّيِّدِ الشُّحَدَةِ ثَبِّتْنَا عَلَى صِرَاتِ عَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ